I met Philip Johnson in uh, 2007 in Cincinnati, downtown Cincinnati. There was a rally to uh, uh, and and to support uh, an amendment to help save the Delta Queen in 2007. Philip was still in college, hadn't graduated yet, so it was. It was a pleasure to meet him then uh, and hearing uh, his interest, as many of us have, in, in the steamer Delta Queen. And uh, I just wanted to mention that along with that, that Philip is a native of Louisville, Kentucky. Like many before him, was first exposed to the river and steamboats through a school field trip on the steamer Bell of Louisville. From that point on, he was hooked and took a great interest in the annual great steamboat race in Louisville on the Wednesday before the Kentucky Derby. And that big out-of-town boat would come and race the bell. His growing childhood interest and fascination deepened from the, for the Delta Queen as the years passed, and he visited the boat any chance he could when it was landed at Louisville or Cincinnati. Over time, and with the help of some of the Delta Queens crew, Philip managed to catch a ride overnight from Louisville to Cincinnati whenever an empty stateroom became available. Philip's love for the water, boats, and steam never waned into adulthood. He started his career working in shipyards for the U.S. Navy's large caliber gun programs and more recently has moved into the coal-fired utility industry. For the last 10 years, Philip has been actively involved in the maintenance, preservation, and exemption process for the steamer Delta Queen. He is one of the original partners who purchased the St Delta Queen steamboat in 2015, and today acts as vice president of marine operations for the revived Delta Queen Steamboat Company. Philip has also served as part-time assistant engineer on the steamer Bell of Louisville since 2010, providing relief to full-time crew when needed. Never a stick stranger to rolling up his sleeves to get dirty on a steam boat. You may also catch him from time to time on Captain Don Sanders, who's with us tonight, uh, Sternwheeler the Clyde, which has been mentioned uh, uh, to our members in the S&D Reflector. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Philip Johnson as our guest speaker. So it's, it's really an honor to be here. I, I kind of feel a little bit <coughs> humbled to be asked, but uh, <coughs> I joked last year that, uh, you know, Doc was so captivating and I thought, man, I feel sorry for whoever has to follow him. <laughs> and then six months later, I get a call from Vic, and I thought, ugh, I ate my words on that one. But so, <clears throat> but kind of as Vic said, I, I've been uh, closely involved with the Delta Queen for the last 10 years, but uh, I've been around the boat since about 1993. And ironically, everybody that's currently involved with the Delta Queen uh, we all first experienced the boat in 1993, so we thought that was kind of an odd coincidence, but uh, <clears throat> which I know was not nearly as impressive as some of the people in this room. But uh, So what I wanted to talk about tonight, rather than go into the history of the boat, which most of you know, is just kind of a current status update. You know, the Delta Queen today <clears throat> in Homa, <coughs> and then the accomplishments that we have managed to achieve, and then kind of what's next. So... Hopefully it uh, will clear things up out there. So as a lot of you know, the vessel's currently docked in a private shipyard in Homa, which is about an hour due west of New Orleans. And <clears throat> the there's a lot of advantages to that spot that we, we really didn't uh, realize until after she's been there a little bit longer. Uh, the initial plan, as we all thought, was the boat would go into Homa and it would be there maybe nine months to a year, and then the exemption would be here and we would be up and going. And as we all know, the exemption was a little harder fight than we expected. But uh, <clears throat> every day of the year, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, the boat is manned with uh, uh, security that makes rounds. And you know, their job is mainly to keep people off the boat, but also to uh, 
uh, monitor the boat and make sure we don't have any uh, you know water issues or anything like that but with none of the systems online uh, she's really pretty easy to watch um, the bilges are all completely dry which is something we fought in Chattanooga a lot when all the equipment was running but uh, she's been pretty happy sitting there uh, one thing we have maintained the entire time was active fire suppression because when you're fighting for an exemption for a wooden boat, the last thing you ever want to risk is the thing catching on fire. So uh, even today, the sprinkler system's fully charged in service. Um, where we are tied up, we have connection to uh, water supply that uh, with a turn of a valve, we can instantly charge the entire you know, fire main if we had to. So. Uh, the boat's pretty well protected, and uh, unfortunately, she sat there long enough we had to develop a hurricane action plan, but it wasn't too terribly difficult, and you'll see why in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, if any of you have been on the internet, you've probably seen some of the pictures. We get a lot of people who like to drive up to the boat, snap a couple pictures, and then post them all over for the world to see how bad a shape she's in, and she's falling apart, and Unfortunately, for liability reasons, we can't let them on the boat. And if they came on the boat, this is what they would see. These pictures were all taken within the last probably six to eight months. As you can tell, some are better than others because uh, I had a, a friend was on there and he had a much better camera than I have on an iPhone. So to our uh, pleasure, we have some of his. But the grand staircase is you know, pretty much as you would expect to see it. Um, the Jimmy Carter suite up uh, on the sun deck, you know, the woods all still in good shape. We've really fought, our focus has been to keep water out of the boat, and that's water from above, not water from below. And uh, so that, that's been the main fight. Uh, sun deck cabins have taken most of the, the brunt of any water intrusion, but it's really been very minimal. Um, the whole trip down from Chattanooga, we went through gallons and gallons and gallons of roof sealant because the crew had nothing else to do, so they sealed the roof, and uh, it's, it's paid off for us. Uh, <clears throat> but if, if you walk through the boat, uh, you know, you pop open any cabin door, this is pretty much what you're going to find. The bedding has been uh, bagged and tagged, and um, the, uh, I, I put a bunk cabin in there because I know there's a few of you who are quite fans of the bunk cabins, but... Uh, yeah, Oh, really? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, that's what you'll find. Uh, a lot of the light bulbs are burned out, but other than that, she's you know, about ready to make the beds and run a vacuum sweeper and, and move on through. But uh, the purser's desk, forward cabin lounge. I kind of joke to some people, it's like a time capsule. When you walk on the boat and you walk through it, it kind of looks like people walked off yesterday. It's just like time has stood still. So, and back in the aft cabin lounge, you got uh, Captain Betty over there. She's still hanging out, which is ironic because I've told a few people, we took all of the, the artwork off the walls and wrapped it in bubble, bubble wrap and, you know, stored it. But two pictures somehow got overlooked, completely unintentional because the people who were packing this stuff up don't understand the history or significance of some of the people. And it was Betty Blake and Mary Green, so. <laughs> Take that, you know, with what you will. But uh, the engine room is uh, one of the dirtier places. Unfortunately, it's a little more exposed to the, the atmosphere. There is the next slip over from us is a limestone loadout facility. And they take the, tr the gravel out of barges and they put it in dump trucks. And then they run it around the Delta Queen to the next slip on the other side. So we're covered on three sides with dust five days a week. And that has been frustrating, but, uh, you know, not much we can do about it. Uh, so we get a lot of kind of dust and buildup, as you can see on the floors. But otherwise, it's about the same. You'll notice um, there's no telegraph. All of the brass was removed from the boat and hid because back in uh, 20, well, let's see what that had been, 2014 in the fall, we didn't own the boat yet, but I still had access to the boat through the, uh, the tenants who were caring for it for Zantara. And myself and two others from the Bell Louisville went down to the Delta Queen because we had no idea what was going to happen to the boat at that point, whether Zantara was going to work with us to let us buy it or what they were going to do. And they had uh, called in a, um, some fleeting people. They had actually got a scrap survey. So I was pretty convinced the boat was going to end up in the fleet. So I got some of the guys from the Bell, and we went down, 
and stripped anything that could easily walk off or be easily removed and then boxed it up, tagged it, you know, where it came from. And this included calliope whistles, gauges, anything that you could get off with a screwdriver or a wrench we figured would walk the minute she got in the fleet. So all that stuff was hidden, but we had to be more creative because we knew a lot of people knew where the hiding spots were on the Delta Queen. <laughs> so we had to think a little harder about where to hide stuff. And uh, so uh, we kind of joked, there's only two of us that know where everything's at. And if they got a crowd of about five together, they could figure out where all of it is. But uh, it, it's hidden in various places on the boat. Uh, so, as I said, uh, here's some exterior shots. The boat is in a, it's just a private slip. It's a thousand foot long slip. And uh, one of the benefits were, you know, God forbid, which we've never even been close to the situation, but if she were to break all of her lines in a strong storm, she can only go forward about three feet. She can go to the right about four feet. She can go to the left about 50 feet. And the anchor is laid out in front of her about uh, 200 feet ahead of the boat. So. I don't think if she broke totally free, she's going to get very far. So that has worked out well. But I was telling some of the others, Homa is far enough inland that you know, we've weathered three or four hurricanes. And by the time they get to the Delta Queen, they're, they're barely more than an, uh, you know, a strong storm, heavy rain. And uh, you don't get storm surge in Homa hardly at all, which was, is the bigger concern, far more than the wind, really, if she was you know, in a canal somewhere else. So. Uh, it's worked well for her, and um, hopefully she won't be there too much longer, but so far it's, it's worked for us. Uh, so to talk about some of the exterior appearance, the boat, I will be honest, does not look that great when you walk, you know, pull up on her, and uh, there's some reasons for that. And a lot of people think she's really deteriorated, but really she's just dirty. And as you can see here, just washing the boat off makes it look like you just painted it. Um, that all that airborne dust just sticks to her in that humidity and she turns black fairly, fairly quickly. And a uh, good example, when we do clean the boat on occasion, on the left you see what she looks like before on the overheads, which I don't know why the overheads, you wouldn't think being above would stick as much as the walls, but they're always worse. And then just after cleaning them for about 10 minutes, that's what you get. The problem is, if you've ever stood on the wharf and looked up at the Delta Queen, what do you see? The overheads. That's all you can see is all this black. So um, it, it does look alarming, but as you saw in the other pictures, she's really in great shape still. The interior is really good. Um, the, the weather decks and, you know, some of the stuff have taken some abuse, but it was all, you know, pretty typical stuff that they dealt with when the boat was running and they had a crew to fix it, and we have a much smaller crew and, and a smaller budget. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of what the boat looks like today, if you were to go down and take a tour or see the boat. So I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, what we have been up to. Uh, we haven't been real vocal, but we have been very busy over the last four years. Um, most recently, as you all know, we uh, were able to get the exemption through Congress and then signed into law, which is something I'll honestly admit I didn't know if was ever going to happen. But uh, after a failed attempt in uh, 13 and then another one in 18, we finally uh, did it uh, towards the end of 18 when it was put into uh, the Coast Guard authorization bill. So uh, I l I've learned more about politics with the Delta Queen than you ever could learn in school and uh, what I've learned is if you have an important issue to you that's not real important to the rest of the world then you just need to tack it onto a bill that is important and then it'll go through and that's pretty much how about a hundred other topics got through was riding on the uh, uh, Coast Guard authorization bill so um, there was a little negotiating back and forth uh, most of you've seen the language and some of the things we have to do for the boat but uh, we, we feel confident that it can be you know, the requirements can be met. So uh, that exemption will take us through December 1st of 2028. And uh, I think we'll be working on it long before 2028 to get that uh, extended if we're able to get it running here soon. Um, to celebrate, because we were all at the workboat show when it was uh, signed into, or not signed, but passed by the house, a couple of us were hanging out on the Natchez and we thought, you know, it would be really cool to hear the Delta Queen's whistle because we hadn't, none of us had heard it in almost 10 years. And uh, so when you have a bunch of crew, you know, all about the same age and 
ambitious and young and full of energy, we, uh, I called Matt down, and then he talked to um, Stephen Nicklin, that, that's who's right there, and asked uh, Captain Nick, said, hey, can, can we bring the Delta Queens whistle over and blow it on the Natchez? And they said, well, just make sure you don't mess anything up. So <laughs> I hurried back to the Delta Queens, started cobbling together parts and, and fittings and stuff, and we brought it over. And uh, that, was, that was a pretty cool experience for us. And we didn't tell uh, Captain Hawley about it at all. We were going to keep it a surprise because we knew he was going to be down there and um, <clears throat> wanted to just spring it on him. And so when we got it all plumbed in, everybody kind of waited. And then when he came up, he was the first person to blow it. And we, we thought that was fitting. And there was a lot of <clears throat> grown men with tears in their eyes. But uh, I think we'll see if it works. This was... We ran the whistle on two trips, and uh, we had talked about when they make If you've rode the Natchez, you know she does a landing whistle for every excursion. You know, they really play the part. And um, we said, well, should we do the first half with the Natchez whistle and then the second half with the Delta Queen? And uh, it was uh, Stephen was the captain, and he said, no, I hear that whistle all the time. So... Him and uh, Bubba came out, and they made the landing whistle for, I think this was the uh, lunch crew. Should have saved that for the end, and I don't think he, the rest is not going to be as good. I promise. But, uh, <clears throat> we we kind of joke and wonder how much fuel we wasted blowing that thing because we blew it a lot. But uh, it, it was a lot of fun, and and I tell you, other than you, know, I have to be partial to the Delta Queen, but the Natchez is probably the top of my favorite cruise. That's just a great family, and and really have a lot of thanks for the support that they give us down in New Orleans. But uh, so once uh, the exemption was passed, we had to quickly get back in gear. And, you know, as I said before, some of us were even internally starting to lose some faith that it was going to happen. So we'd kind of, uh, well, let's see, and going through the motions. So when it did happen, we had to get our, get our crap back together, to be blatantly honest. And so <clears throat> we quickly started engaging a bunch of the vendors that we talked to and I needed to get them back on the boat with current fresh numbers and uh, work through getting the business plan and the financials back up to date and, and everything you know fresh and accurate so we could start shopping it again. And uh, in that process, we uh, <clears throat> finally secured, uh, after narrowing down a couple different options, we got the, uh, the contractor that we're working with for the boilers in place. And that, the boilers are really what this whole project centers around because they're one, required. There, there's no way we can reuse the existing boilers. And uh, two, they're the longest lead time and the most expensive item in the entire refurbishment project. So uh, that was important to get that lined up and, and to figure out how we were going to skin that cat. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then the other more interesting, well, equally interesting thing to me was we had to do, you know, part of the exemption says we have to reduce the uh, the fire load and the combustibility content of the vessel on an annual basis. So the important thing was, well, how much combustible material does the Delta Queen actually have on it? And so <clears throat> that was tricky to find somebody who could even help us arrive at that number. But uh, some of you may be familiar with Jay Webster. He was the um, port engineer for the Delta Queen back in the 90s, and he has since went on to have a, a pretty successful career in uh, <clears throat> marine engineering and project management and whatnot. So his experiences after the Delta Queen and then his experiences with the Delta Queen made him the perfect fit. Plus, he had all the old information that he'd saved from when he worked there. So uh, we had them come on, and that survey took, oh, I think it's about a month and a half of back-and-forth visits and measurements. But 
Uh, we were able, and I'll go through that, it's, it's pretty interesting, but uh, so we were able to come up with the exact amount of combustible material in the vessel structure and how she was built. Um, <clears throat> and then part of the uh, business plan we actually had, because this is such a small, uh, tight-knit world in the, the river cruise industry, that uh, we knew enough people, we were able to get 15 years of actual financials from previous operations to follow trends and then see how they were matching with inflation to uh, base all of our budget numbers off of and make sure we weren't overlooking anything. And, and the business plan is very detailed down to the soap and toilet paper. So that, that's why it has taken so long to get it refined and in the process was able to develop a five-year forward-looking operating budget, which is what any uh, uh, financial group you go to is going to want to see. So <clears throat> combing through all of that after we'd met with all the vendors and updated the, the numbers and got everything fresher, we had the financial packet completed by February. And on March 1st, we engaged uh, two different financial brokers to help us with the project. Um, <clears throat> the, tr the obstacle in maritime financing is unlike a house that's on shore and doesn't really cost anything to sit there if the bank has to uh, take it back on collateral, nobody wants to collateralize a boat. Uh, there's been too many boats that have gone under and then the financial institutions are stuck with this huge bill to keep the thing you know, afloat and maintained while they're trying to find a new buyer. It's uh, difficult to find buyers when the market's not, you know, like a house is easy. You, you just call a realtor and in a month or two it's sold. That's not the case with the boat. So. One of the things we'd done several years ago was, you know, in forming the partnership was to make sure that we had a partner that had the uh, financial assets that could back any note because we knew the boat was going to be an issue until, you know, it was a chicken or the egg thing. The boat will be worth money when it's restored, but right now it's not worth enough to, you know, cover the note. So we had a partner that could fully collateralize the note and, you know, once somebody said, we'll give you the money, we were good to go. So the exemption took a little too long and unfortunately health issues crop up and that partner is no longer able to provide that uh, collateral about the same time we got two different groups that said they were willing to fund it. But then underwriting said, well, we're not gonna use the boat. So that has caused us to back up and, and have to repunt a little bit. And we're currently working through that. We've got several good leads, um, either for a new partner. We've got a couple interested that we're trying to work out. We've got to make sure it's the right person because we don't want to get someone in a position where they could totally take control of the boat. And then, you know, we've got to make sure that things are balanced out because the last thing that any of us who got involved wanted to see happen to the Delta Queen was the same thing that happened last time her exemption ran out and there would be no safety net to carry her as a hotel or something like that. And you know, our goal would be to renew the exemption, continue to run the boat, but we always have put in a contingency plan that you know, once the boat is up and running, a portion of the profits will be put into an endowment, a, a, a nonprofit or something, so that should the boat be forced out of service a second time, she's got a, a nest egg to rely on and you know, be successfully converted into some kind of shoreside attraction. So trying to think you know, past today and tomorrow to make sure that the boat didn't end up exactly right back where it's at today. So that's been kind of tricky to balance, but uh, like I said, we're working through it. Um, one of our brokers has got a pretty interesting strategy that we're working with to um, try and get the money released in segments because I'm sure with the first distribution of money, the things we could do with it, the boat would then appraise for, you know, more than we were asking for. So um, it's just difficult. It's definitely not like buying a house or a car. So I guess that that's the, you know, point I wanted to get across, but we're still feeling pretty comfortable based on the feedback we're getting from the brokers that, uh, you know, that six to 12 months, we're still with inside that window, and you know, March 1st, so hopefully, you know, long before March 1st of next year, we see a lot of movement and uh, we can get going. So, uh, back in 20, oh man, 2016, 16 or 17, I think it was 16, we uh, did establish a 
uh, home port and headquarters for the Delta Queen Steamboat Company. Uh, I'd like to stress that the itineraries will be pretty much what they always have been. The boats follow the seasons. And the, the building is actually pretty interesting. It's a uh, log cabin that was moved to Kimswick. Uh, it dates back to the 1770s. And it's about 5,000 square feet, which for our reduced, more lean office staff should be more than, more than enough. So uh, I wanted to talk about the structural content survey. Uh, the, the goals of it were to, like I said before, establish a total weight of the combustible material used in the construction of the vessel. And then we needed to know what materials were used, where they were used, and then you know, the methods of construction. And then we knew back in the 1990s when Jay was working with the Delta Queen and she had just uh, narrowly obtained another exemption in, in 93 that uh, the company started working towards trying to make the boat safer. That's when the new fire detection system went in and the much upgraded sprinkler system went in. And uh, <clears throat> so we knew a lot of work had been done and we needed to quantify that, find out where, how, and what they did. And it also stands as you know the coast guard accepted these types of changes in the past so that gives you a little bit of leverage if they didn't want to uh, accept same changes again and a little story that mike williams has always told me about the sprinkler system on the delta queen it is so over over capacity that uh, they actually had to convince the coast guard to reduce the nozzle size on the sprinkler heads because of the number of sprinkler heads on the boat uh, you could capsize it if the sprinkler system totally started to discharge. And so there was all these pictures of the Normandy being thrown around, and it's like, oh, it's the last thing we need to bring up is another boat that caught fire. But uh, <clears throat> so uh, this picture here, and, and we'll see on the next table, but uh, this is a sketch of the main deck and how the timber is laid in. There's actually two layers of decking on the Delta Queen's main deck, and this is where most of the wood weight is. The very first layer is uh, two by four planks that are attached with J hooks to the steel frame of the hull, and they're all Douglas fir. And then on top of them, because fir's a little bit softer, is the famous one by four planks of the Siamese ironwood. So uh, that makes her main deck very heavy. And you'll, you'll see, oh. so the vessel's total weight, uh, this was taken from the 1999 stability book where they, you know, calculate displacement and everything, was 2,159 metric tons. Of that, the original hull was 614 tons, and then the boilers machinery was 458, and then all the work done at Dravo added 55 more tons, and then the new hull, nearly doubled the old hull, as we all kind of expected, at 524 tons. And then the miscellaneous, I put piping, wiring, ducts, but that also includes when they do dead weight calculations of a vessel, they take into account any normal furnishings that would be on the boat in service, so that also encompasses all your beds, furniture, you know, dishes, that, that stuff adds up when the boat's as big as it is. But surprisingly, the cabin and deck structure, the wood essentially, is only 14% of the Delta Queen's total weight at 316 tons. So we don't have as much wood to deal with as everyone thought. Even the surveyor, who was intimately familiar with the boat, was uh, rather shocked when they started crunching all the numbers. He said, this can't be right. So then he went back and he did it in the reverse way and he started adding up all the steel weights that he could find and came to about the same number. So. We said, well, numbers don't lie, M must be the case. Uh, <clears throat> so when the important number that we have to remember for compliance with the exemption is the 316 tons of wood. And then, you know, we have to reduce as much of it as we can over the, the time that the vessel's in service, but in still keeping with the historic integrity of the vessel. So there's a balancing act, and there, I'm sure there's going to be some negotiating back and forth. and and talking with the Coast Guard, the 10% number was driven largely by legislators. The Coast Guard never pushed for a quantified number. Their concern is over passenger safety, as it should be. And so <clears throat> part of the balance is, you know, remove enough to meet the requirement, but also to meet the Coast Guard's safety concerns, which are largely passenger egress. If, if the vessel were to catch fire, 
can people get off in, a, a, in time and safely? So uh, as you saw in the, some of the exemption requirements is we have to have forward egress off the vessel. Currently, the only way off is through the stage. Well, if you know, the, the plant goes down, then you lose steam and the stage is steam operated. So they wanted something that required no power from the vessel. And so the life rafts and slides that are on the stern a similar arrangement would be used up front. So that's how we're able to um, meet that requirement. But uh, <clears throat> you'll see here the decking, and, and as I talked about with the other slide, the decking is where the majority of the weight of the wood is. And so when trying to protect the historic fabric of the Delta Queen, which is the intention of the legislation, uh, a lot of our focus initially is going to be on decking. So the decking on the Delta Queen, if we start taking it off uh, and then replacing it with a non-combustible, there are so many new materials available today that weren't available 10 years ago when the Delta Queen was taken out of service. You can actually replicate all of our trims, all of our molding and everything in a composite. And so if we had to go back with, a, say, an aluminum deck, well, the top of the decks today have Dexatec, so you, you can't see the planking lines anyway. But on the over, that was one of my questions. What about the overheads? You know, I don't want to look up and it look like a, a new steel boat. It's got to still feel like the Delta Queen. And so that's when we worked with these different uh, composite veneer um, companies. And they can actually replicate exactly what we have in a non-combustible uh, composite that can be overlaid of any of the aluminum or steel use. So uh, the, the challenge will be trying to find what's wood and what's not once you know all that work is done. Uh, one thing that I was telling some of the others is kind of interesting, uh, I had the uh, privilege of going over to the city of New Orleans when they were putting the wood paneling in, which is not actually wood, but uh, I talked to the manufacturer of it and they said uh, technically the way that wood grain is printed, they could take a high res image of any paneling and then print that and put it on the, the composite panel so you could match the Delta Queen's wood grain exactly because it'd be a picture of it. But um, that's if we got to a point where we had to replace interior paneling. But based on how much of the deck and combing is uh, combustible, it'll be a long time before you start touching any of the interior work. So I talked about uh, some of the steel or the wood that has been removed and replaced with steel and non-combustibles previously in the 1970s, the entire main deck or below the main deck rather down in the hold where the crew quarters are, that was all remediated of any combustibles. All the cabins down there are steel. There is nothing that could burn below the main deck in the structure. And then up on the main deck, this work was done in the 90s. All of that uh, ironwood that used to go out to the four peak was removed back to the Orleans room and then the crew hold and went, or the crew mess rather. And this area here where the freezers are and all that, that's been removed as well. So that's all steel deck and uh, was pulled out. One of our first focuses is going to be the galley because that's what we call low hanging fruit. It's gonna be very easy to get in there, pull all that decking out while the galley's gutted, and then go back with steel plate, and that will count for quite a bit of weight. Um, this area should not be shaded. It's actually all still wood right here. So um, that's another low hanging fruit area that will be easy to recover some of that uh, combustible requirement that we have to take out. So <clears throat> main deck is where all the easy stuff is. And a lot of this has got to be pulled out for the boiler replacement anyway. So we feel confident we'll more than exceed 10% in year one. Uh, so moving up through the, through the vessel on the cabin deck, some of you've heard the stories about the post have been all uh, cut to jack the pilot house up. Um, <clears throat> those posts have steel inside them and then the wood was put back on. The walls in some places, which not marked on here unfortunately, but a lot of the framing in the walls is actually steel studs with the panels put back over them. Um, all of these bathrooms when they're renovated are all steel studs with the paneling put back over them. So, and the same thing when you go up to the sun deck. There's actually been a whole lot of work done on the sun deck to remove combustible material. So, 
Um, the cu cumulative removal in the 90s equated to 25 tons, and it was about 8% of that 316. So we're already below the 316 number as it is. Uh, one of the other things that we were very happy to find out when we purchased the vessel, we had to do a complete survey of the hull to, uh, without dry docking, and we had to do as much as we could uh, to determine the condition before the Coast Guard would approve her for towing. And uh, it was Nashville sector came down because she was in Chattanooga. And I, I don't know this for sure, but they didn't come down overly excited to see the Delta Queen. Imagine that. And so I think they were expecting to find something bad. And they told us we had to provide access to every single void space on, and tank space on the boat. Which if you're familiar with the fact she has a double hull, that is not something you want to hear because it means lots and lots of work. The, the surveyor, I scheduled the surveyor to come the same day so we would do it all one time. And he asked me, he said, do you have any advice before I get over there? I said, yes, bring a cordless impact and wrenches because if we're doing it by hand, we'll be here about five days. There's 37 hatches and each hatch has like 16 large bolts that holds it on and then a gasket. It was horrible. But we, we got inside all of the um, tanks except for the ones that had fuel in them, which was, I think, just six. And uh, this is what we found. You know, it, it looks a little dirty. But the Coast Guard's comment was, wow, we, we really didn't expect this. The insides of this thing look like a three-year-old ship because the coating that was applied in 1990 when they put the new hull on has held up that well. So um, she, the, her hull was in fantastic shape and uh, is pretty much the least of our worries. So for all the people that say she's got a wooden hull, here's pictures to prove she has not one but two steel hulls. So uh, the boiler replacement, as we talked about, is the biggest, you know, I call it the heart transplant for the Delta Queen. And uh, <clears throat> there's been so much talk about how to do this because no boat was ever built or intended to outlive its boilers. You know, boats are built around their boilers. The boilers go in during construction, and uh, the people putting them in are pretty sure the only way they're coming out is the boat's being torn down and dismantled. So uh, how, there was talk, well, do you, do you come up from beneath the boat? Well, how are you going to jack the Delta Queen up on blocks on a dry dock high enough to get a boiler under her? That's, that's not feasible. So most of us thought we were going to go in through the side. And um, if you, you've noticed and you're familiar with steamboats, the Delta Queen lacks one feature that even a lot of steel-hulled boats have, and that was hog chains or, you know, kind of hog chain type bracing. Well, that's because she has an all-steel hull with um, a, the Denny patented girder beam that run down, runs down her main deck. But then she has X braces that are critical to her frame structure. And the problem was they're outboard of the boiler room. So if you go in through the side, you're going to have to cut into all that framing. And the poor boat's been modified and twisted and moved so much. We were a little hesitant to do it. The naval architects looked at, oh, it should be okay. We can do this and that. But I've heard too many horror stories about the boat. You know, when you take something out, it never goes back in because she'll relax and twist. So we wanted to figure out if there was any way we could avoid going through the side of the boat. So then the next theory was, let's pull the stack casing apart and come in through the roof if we can get the pieces small enough. So then <clears throat> we talked to three or four different boiler suppliers, and one of them stuck out to us. They are a firm that specializes in uh, providing heating boilers for um, like skyscrapers, you know, big urban development type buildings. Again, places where the boiler was never really thought about pulling out they specialize in field direction. So just like the Delta Queen was built, they assemble their boilers in a factory, as you see here, and then they take them apart and take them to the site in pieces and erect them in place. And so they intentionally try to make stuff as small as possible because they're having to shimmy it down elevator shafts and stuff like that. And when they came on the boat, it was like, ah, finally a sigh of relief. Somebody doesn't think we're totally nuts. And uh, so when they looked at the boat and the space and measured it out, uh, their plan <clears throat> was to bring all of the pieces across the main deck. And what really astonished us, they said, well, we can just do it you know, with the boat in the water right where she sits. And the only major structural change that we have to do 
is we have to take out this bulkhead along uh, the fire alley, but in this one right here. The good news is neither of them are load-bearing bulkheads, and the largest piece of the boiler will fit down this hallway and slide right through there and drop into the boiler room. So the boilers, the new boilers are much longer and will sit, you know, long ways is where the old boilers sat like this. And the old boilers are going to come out pretty much the same way these are going in. The largest piece on both the old and the new boilers is the steam drums. And uh, they are small enough that, you know, there's people you can call that specialize in rigging and they can get the stuff out and, you know, move it out. So uh, <clears throat> the, the boiler sizing was interesting, too, because the, the boilers on the Delta Queen, as everybody's heard, the old legend, they were intended for destroyers. And they produced 60,000 pounds of steam per hour. That was their rated, you know, size. And uh, we knew that that was probably overkill, but we didn't know how much. And we, you know, so what I did was <clears throat> the boiler company brought in a maritime guy that does all of the firing and controls. And he looked, went through the whole system and has determined that over the years with all the reduction in uh, requirements, primarily when they took the steam dynamos off of the Delta Queen and used diesel electric for generation. The boilers that are on there today have been derated by smaller burners and only produce 35,000 pounds of steam per hour anyway. So that was our benchmark. We need a boiler that can produce 35,000 pounds per hour per boiler to ensure we have the same, you know, generating capacity the boat has today. And then the other concern that a lot of people, including us, had when you say a heating boiler for a steamboat, those typically have not worked well in the past, and it's due to the dynamic loading. You know, in a building, your steam consumption is very consistent. But on a steamboat that's coming into a lock after running full ahead for 12 hours, and she sits there on, you know, a stop or dead slow and then takes off full ahead again, a heating boiler has a hard time uh, compensating for that but these boilers that uh, the company that we're working with they actually have larger steam drums than the ones that are on there today so we have more reserve capacity than the boat would have today and that that will help offset the issues with dynamic loading so uh, then the, the the three big items this is the second one is the generator replacement the generators on the delta queen date back to the late 80s they are extremely fuel thirsty they far predate any tier ratings for environmental compliance and under full load each generator could burn up to the 27 gallons an hour so it's insane consumption so <clears throat> We're going to have to go back with, since we're replacing them, anytime you put new machinery on, if it's new and not overhauled, then you have to meet the current uh, environmental requirements with the EPA and the Coast Guard. So we'll be Tier 3 compliant with the new generators, which will give us, like I said, much increased efficiency and reduced emissions and reduced operating costs. The electrical system on the Delta Queen, most people don't realize, was completely replaced in the 90s and is... For the most part, we have to do a few items to it to uh, come into modern, you know, current compliance. But for the most part, it's pretty close to compliant as it is now and won't require, a, you know, there's been rumors. Oh, they're going to have to completely rewire the boat. Not the case at all. Uh, so, you know, we're going to put new generators in and make some updates to the switchboard and we should be good. One of the requirements of the exemption is that every generator or boiler has to have a, its own fully enclosed enclosure with dedicated fire suppression. So that's been uh, just another item that we had to work through and uh, the uh, generator suppliers have been, you know, they've been able to meet that because they have the same requirements in the oil and gas industry. So, and they'll go in much the same way as the uh, boilers did, just down through the uh, fire alley and then drop through the floor. I didn't have a very good graphic for this, so we ended up with a toilet. <laughs> I could have thought of some worse ones, but this will do. So the uh, sewage treatment system on the boat is uh, n not fully compliant the way it was set up when the boat was running with today's requirements. And it's been road hard and put up wet. It's not in very good shape. So we looked at overhauling it, and then we looked at a complete replacement, and a uh, complete replacement is what's going to make the most sense. But uh, what 
currently the boat has three different systems on it and we're going to switch that to a single system located up front and <clears throat> we needed to meet current requirements we had to have a surge tank the boat currently doesn't have one at all so you know when someone's using a shower and that's the other bad thing about the delta queen's plumbing everything with the exception of a handful of showers goes into the uh, what they call the black water the sewage system and so she's processing probably as much or more water than the American Queen processes on a daily basis because all of that is going through the black water treatment system and we looked at redoing that but then you're talking totally replumbing the boat so we thought well how do we deal with what we have and the good news about the new boilers is they will burn number two fuel and the old boilers burn number six fuel so you had to segregate generator fuel and boiler fuel but now everything's going to be burning the same fuel so the generators can use the same fuel tanks as the boilers which meant now we have extra tank space up front that we don't necessarily need and so we're going to convert one of the um, one or two depending on you know the naval architects have to work out the stability issues of the uh, old diesel fuel tanks up under the forward crew hold into the uh, the surge tank for the sewage system but so the boilers is about a 32 week lead time the generators is about 22 weeks and then the the water treatment is about 20 week lead time and they all go in the same space so uh, that's pretty much your critical path what's going to drive her return to service uh, <clears throat> so while waiting on the large funding to come in working with what we have we started fixing a lot of the wood rot on the boat um, this is actually very typical maintenance despite how crude it looks uh, when the boat was in service the way the water sheds on the deck it would always collect in the uh, right there by the railings in that little trough yeah. and uh, it would seep in there and just totally destroy the combing on the decks and they would replace a lot of this about every five years the delta queen has not been in service for 10 years now and it has still rained just as much every year so with that in mind we've got a lot to catch up on and um, i don't know if some of you remember craig hall Craig was the boat's carpenter while she was running, but every time she went into layup, they would call in uh, Byron Copping, and he would also work with Craig, and we were able to get Byron to come back and work with us, and Byron has been uh, the one in charge of all the wood. No one's allowed to touch the wood unless Byron okays how and what, and he's really quite an artist. One of the stories that so, somebody was trying to describe Byron to me, which if you met him, he's quite an individual, but he's really an artist when it comes to this old wood carpentry there's very few people who have that skill set and the delta queen has all these rounded corners all over the place which is a carpenter's nightmare mm -hmm. and what he would do is he would go look at wood find old dried wood from a mill or something and he would set up saw horses and he would wet it down in places and just let it sit in the sun and he might do that for a week to get it to naturally start to bow until it would fit the spot and so when you see something like that, you're like, huh, we can't just call anybody. You know, he, he really knows what he's doing. So our focus has been all that deck combing, a lot of the drain pans, the headers, which is this white area here, and then uh, some of the transversal beams, the ends have rotted off. Um, some of you may have noticed in the past, if you walked and looked up at the overheads, there was these uh, uh, <clears throat> joints where it looked like new wood had been scarfed in well that's because they had to do this every you know four or five years and so we essentially are repeating that over again all the wood for the delta queen you can't go to lowe's or home depot and buy it it's all custom milled it's all custom sizes and it was it's all kiln dried because you don't want to stick it up there get it nice and perfect and then come back you know six months later and it shrunk which if any of you built a deck from lowe's you know that happens so <clears throat> kind of back to uh to the artistry that that byron was doing <clears throat> what he did anywhere we'd run into rotten this here is actually original wood i was telling someone earlier when you go on the delta queen and probably the delta king today if you find rotted wood more than likely it's not original wood the original wood is of such high quality it was all old growth clear grain you know real fine hardwoods that uh, it, it's really stood the test of time. When you find rot is where somebody's put new wood in and it's just falling apart. You know, for example, look at how wide the grain is here. 
And then, well, that's not a good picture, but, you know, the grain is much tighter on this old growth forestry. But uh, what Byron does when he redoes an area is a laminated scarf joint. What that means is he cuts it in stages and then will, you know, put it in like this and then he'll layer it. And between the inside and outside board is marine ply that he puts in there too. So that makes it a very strong continuous beam. Once he got all the way around the sun deck, it was essentially a one piece beam all the way around. So there was no joints to let go. And it looks very good, but unfortunately you can't see it from shore. Uh, here's a good example of, you know, when he started, it was just completely rotted out right there. And then when he was done, here's what it looked like. And that's just primered in. Uh, this is one of the worst areas on the boat. Uh, it was an area that was slated to be rebuilt in 2009, but as we know, the boat never made it to 2009. And in fact, the same area had previously been rebuilt by the operators. I think it was, uh, I don't think Majestic did, I think it was Delaware North, um, had totally rebuilt this area. And it's where the deck took a lot of stress because in California, there was lifeboats up here, and so all the posts were on the inside. They weren't out here, and it, it caused a lot of deck failure in this area, and so the other side had been completely rebuilt, and so that's something we had to deal with, and so here you see the ends of new transversal beams, an all-new header, and you can see that stepped laminated joint right there, and when he got it done, it all looked brand new, So, and the deck no longer bounces when you walk through there. All the trim work, this was kind of a, a cool story for us. So when Byron got involved, of course, you know, like any good tradesperson, he, he knew where all the people were, and he knew where all the resources were. And one of them was um, one of the lumber companies that supported the, the boat before. For whatever reason, they saved all of the custom bits that they had made for the Delta Queen back when she was running. And so they still had all of it and were able to reproduce all of our trim. And so all this new trim matches perfectly to the old trim because it came from the same people and was cut with the same bits. So had we not called Byron, we wouldn't have known that. So like any good project, it's only as good as the people that you, you bring in. I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really, really good people. So yeah, here, there, here's one of those curved joints that that one was built up uh, a little bit differently horizontally but there was the replacement you can see a lot of the paint that's peeled off from water that we're still fighting and dealing with but uh, here's uh, more of the transversal beams that had to be taken out and redone so what are we continuing to do you know the next steps unfortunately as we all hope the funding is taking longer than we expected it to uh, we weren't 100% prepared to lose our uh, equity opportunity that was going to collateralize the loan. So that, that's an obstacle. But just like I was telling someone, when we were in the gallery at uh, D.C., the first time the exemption passed the House, that was 2013, September, and we had no idea that there was a lobbying firm out there, none at all. So you should have seen the look on our faces when, you know, we were sitting there, and then all of a sudden, where did all these people come out of the woodwork saying all this negative stuff in great detail about the Delta Queen? And so just like that surprise, you know, we overcame it. It took a little longer, and we feel confident we can do the same thing with this little funding snafu. But, uh, you know, this, the Delta Queen makes you work for every single thing she gives you. So here we go. But uh, so we're going to continue maintaining the vessel. We, we've had to slow down a little bit of the engineering because, you know, we're trying to determine how much longer do we got to carry the cost. The boat costs us about $30,000 a month to sit there, and that's before you pick up the first paintbrush because we're adamant that you keep security on the boat. The, the first day you take security off the boat, somebody's going to get on there. They're going to vandalize it. Uh, just 40 miles away from where the Delta Queen is tied up, there's a, it's not a big commercial vessel, but it's a very historic uh, family-owned uh, private yacht, just all wood, very beautiful boat, and some vandals came one night and set it on fire, just for no particular reason at all. And so, you know, when you see stuff like that, it reminds you of, I know it's very expensive, but you cannot put a price on having good security, and uh, we've been very fortunate in the five years that she's sat there, what's it, 15, four years, was it four or five? 
yeah, four. Um, we've not had anyone get on the boat. We, we have countless people every week drive up to it. Most of them are harmless and, and you know, very uh, uh, just curious, but we've had a few people roll by at about two in the morning that have had a little too much to drink and they're not quite as harmless in trying to get on and see what's in there. And we've been uh, successful in preventing anyone from getting on the boat. Uh, we've had people come up on jet skis, which I think is very bizarre because in the slip that she's in, we've counted at least five gators that inhabit that area. So the last thing you'd ever catch me on is a, a jet ski down there. But um, uh, so, but we, we've been very fortunate in security on the boat. The boat has uh, stayed dry. She stayed put and uh, has not been vandalized or anything like that. So uh, the only problem is it's just taking too long. Uh, so with that being said, you know, we're gonna continue the engineering and the planning um, as we, you know, we've been quietly raising money and then doing things, raise money, do things. But uh, we have to be careful because we don't know how much longer we're gonna be making those $30,000 a month payments to keep her secure and insured and, and dry. So. That's why, you know, you look and you're like, well, what are they doing? Well, we can't get too crazy because if we get a bunch of engineering and stuff done and get all of our submittals to the Coast Guard and everything approved, and then the funding takes another six months and we can't afford to pay for security, the whole thing could be a moot point. So it's been a constant balancing act, and thus far we've been successful, so God willing, we'll continue to be um, like I said, we've got the, the boilers and the rest of the engineering to finalize. And then once we get that full funding, if someone wrote me a check today, it would be about 14 to 18 months before you saw her on the river. But that, that takes into account a trial, you know, sea trial shakedown, crew training, you know, everything, the whole nine yards so when you can welcome the first passengers. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I feel like I went through that a little fast, but... Uh, you know, we still feel confident that, uh, you know, the boat was declared a national treasure and it's got a huge fan base around the world and we think she's definitely worthy of preserving. So that's why we're doing it. All of us who got into it was, you know, we did it for the love of the boat. Uh, unfortunately, none of us were millionaires. That was probably our first mistake. But, um, you know, we love the Delta Queen. If we didn't, we wouldn't still be sitting here bashing our heads on the wall some days, you know. Most people think we're absolutely crazy, and some days I'm pretty sure they're right. So, <laughs> but here we are, and uh, you know it's 2019. The boat hasn't run in 10 years, but uh, she's still here. So, I think that speaks volumes. <laughs>